Uh, the first thing would be what all still complete. Yes, it's still there. And the thing is approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, yes, we do if we have time. Um, so we will <laughs> mention that you should have gotten minutes from, well, comments from all the various exceptions that were provided. Um, I should say if anyone wants to make a comment or has a question about any of those notes. Uh, the one thing I will say the the once I was in was uh, a request to have more listening sessions. So we will talk about that during the board retreat. Any other comments or questions? Um, now that we have the list, is there a plan to sort of match it to our agendas going forward? Is that part of the listening set, uh, part of our board development, you think? Or? We are going to do that at the board development. Okay, talk great. about how those communications. Great, great. Then uh, approval of the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Brian, uh, Mark, and Jack. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Then next is an approval of the agenda. We don't have any additional agenda. So moved. From Mark. Second. Second. I think Joan Beach and family there, Brian, must be the computer delay. <laughs> Any questions? Then all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And then we go into public comments. Are there any public comments? We do have two that were submitted to be read. <coughs> There's no in-person public comments. Are there public comments? No in-person. Just the no in -person. And the Right. <coughs> That would be right after this. <coughs> so, um, first was from Allie Crosby. I am writing to you to bring attention to a situation that is not set well with me. My husband and I chose to keep our hybrid learning third grader home with us the week after Thanksgiving. Our decision did not come lightly, but with both of us working in healthcare and seeing the increase of cases due to people gathering for Thanksgiving, we thought this was the safest and most comfortable option for our family. I was in contact with his hybrid teacher who also communicated with Mr. Kaminsky. The teacher appeared absolutely fine with it and was very flexible and cooperative. Sawyer was able to Zoom live with his morning class and has included in group discussions, activities, etc., just like he would have been in the classroom. He attended every minute of the instruction just like he would have if he was physically present. His teacher did notify me that Mr. Kaminsky said that the day Sawyer was learning from home would be considered absent. I have a difficult time understanding this as he was present and fully engaged with his hybrid class all week, even receiving compliments from his teacher at what a great learner he was from home. Why should we have to worry about absences right now on top of everything else? Our family was thinking of taking a similar approach for the week of Christmas, after Christmas. But now we must question our decision due to the potential of exceeding absent days. Allie Crosby, 513 Vanderbilt Drive in Wanakee. Next is from Alyssa Fight. My name is Alyssa Fight, and I'm a parent of a third grader at Prairie Elementary. I'm also a special education teacher in the neighboring district. I have been supportive of in-person learning with safety measures in place since the conversation started this summer. A major piece of those safety measures is having a reasonable attendance policy for all students so kids can continue to receive the same level of quality instruction they would receive from the Wanakee Community School District, whether they are in the building live streaming into their classroom from home, fully virtual, or completing asynchronous work. Our family has been extremely careful throughout this pandemic because we are at an increased risk of complications if we contract COVID-19. Before the Thanksgiving break, my husband and I made the decision to keep our son out of school for the week after Thanksgiving because we were concerned about the associated risk associated with gathering for the holiday. This decision was not made lightly, especially with our son is a child with an IEP and is better able to receive the services he needs in person. We notified the school attendance office and our son's teachers the week before Thanksgiving so we could make a plan. His teacher said he would join her and his class through the Zoom links each day. 
My son joined his class, participated in all activities, and completed all his asynchronous work every day that week. He was marked absent, parent request, every day, for both morning and afternoon sessions and on Wednesdays. My son didn't miss a single minute of class, but his attendance record says he missed five mornings and five afternoons that week. As a teacher, I feel strongly that student attendance is one of the biggest factors in determining their success in school. The school district should be doing everything in its power right now to encourage students to participate in instruction, whether in person, all virtual, or asynchronously. The school district should also have policies in place to promote safe behavior to reduce the spread of COVID-19. One of those policies should be to allow hybrid students to participate in learning from home for short periods of time. Please consider changing the current attendance policy to mark students who fully participate in learning, whether virtually or in person as present, regardless of the reason given to keep them from home for the duration of this pandemic. I appreciate all of your time and energy as you work to find ways to safely bring our children back into the school buildings to learn. Thank you, Alyssa Fike. Those were the two public comments we had submitted. So next we will go to the student report. the student input currently um, as high school students. So just to give you some um, notifications about what exactly is happening this month in December throughout the whole school, there will be a virtual holiday sing-along hosted by the Wanaki High School Choir on Thursday, December 17th, which is this week at 7 p.m. So if you want to access that link, I'm sure you can look at the One Key Community School District homepage, specifically high school, to look at that link if you're interested. And One Act Play also um, went to virtual state this, I believe this past week, which um, there were some awards given, which is very exciting that they were able to still do that. And um, lastly, uh, Eco Club. Um, we'll be having a blackout this Sunday night from 8 to 9 where you can just turn off all your lights to save energy and uh, that's right before uh, winter solstice on the 21st. So those are all the main events that are going to happen for the rest of the month throughout the whole school. But Quinn has the student council. Yeah, um, so this um, Thursday we're going to start, and up until on um, break, we're starting theme day weeks, like spirit day for um, the high school. So Thursday is going to be winter clothing, and then Friday, crazy hat day, Monday, pajama day, Tuesday is going to be ugly sweater day. Um, so this is just another way to kind of like engage students more. Um, and then just yesterday, um, student council was able to um, host call and elf again. Um, but this time it was more like Zoom and Elf. <laughs> so um, we had kids from the community, they were able to join a Zoom call and they were able to talk to Elf. Um, so that was pretty fun. And um, we also have upcoming craft days. So since um, a lot of our activities have been canceled, we've been trying to do more things that kind of um, engage, engage the community. So um, we're starting to do craft days where we'll have a student council member um, host a Zoom call with kids from the community and they'll be able to do a craft together and we have hopes to um, deliver like certain supplies that kids can need um, for these crafts and they're able to just kind of with other kids join a Zoom call and do those crafts together so we think that should be really fun. Uh, I think we're going to plan the first one in January. Um, there is also going to be another blood drive upcoming in January and the past one was really successful and we're able to do that like um, safely. Um, so I think that will be another successful blood drive. And a big um, January event of student council is JDRF. And usually last year I think was it $4,000 Anna that yeah. student council raised? Money. raised? And usually how we go about doing that is we have, we get donations from the um, community and like um, local businesses. But this year we're going to more focus on giving back to those local businesses since we can't participate in the um, like raffles that JDRF really does. So we're going to work on using the safe single money to still donate to JDRF, but also kind of give back to the local communities that usually help us. So those are our plans 
for this month and next month. Yeah, so as Quinn said, lots of new and exciting uh, events for student council, regardless of the circumstances. So it's really good to hear. We're really pumped about that. And just lastly to mention, just a whole student report. We were in co or we talked to um, some students from our grade and from grades below us or above us about how they feel um, virtual school has been going so far. And um, aside from the workload and the stress, they have been managing as long as you're responsible with your schedule. So it really just comes down to accountability for yourself. And so they have been managing, but just since it's been getting colder and you can't do as many outside activities, it's been getting a little more tough. But I think winter break will be super beneficial for students. Quinn and I were talking earlier about how we're very excited just to decompress and just enjoy um, uh, spending time with immediate family. And uh, finals are also coming up, but we will see you guys for finals in January. So aside from that, yeah, we think that's it. Do you guys have any questions? When when you're doing this power off thing, is it just to turn lights off or literally turn the power off? Um, so we're gonna like we're focusing mainly on like you know turning your lights off and like TV and and kind of like power sources. Obviously, you can still have like if you need to cook or have like different appliances and stuff. You can do that, but it's just kind of like trying your best to be aware of what you usually use and maybe even not going on like pre-charged electronics because you're gonna have to use energy to charge them anyway later for the time you use them. So um, I know Mrs. Hikes, our Eco Club um, teacher, she was saying how it could be a good time to like, you know, light some candles and then maybe play board games with um, mm -hmm. people in your household. So it, it'll help the planet and I think it'll be a good refresher for everyone involved. That's Thank you, ladies, for being cool. creative. Merry Christmas. Oh, creative yes, things. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Have a good rest of your month, yeah. guys. And Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Have a good us. holiday. They're always a breath of fresh air. I know. <laughs> I always love to hear them. an appreciation for board members for the, um, hosting the listening <coughs> sessions at each of our um, district buildings. Those are um, always, you know, it's a great two-way communication during a typical year, and it was even more um, appreciated this year. Um, I'd also like to appreciate the teaching staff of the, of the district um, for recertifying the WTA as a negotiating body for um, teaching staff. Um, during the recertification election, all teaching staff are eligible to vote. And we, um, if as, uh, somebody doesn't vote, it counts as a no vote. So of all voters, we passed with 99.1%. And then with everyone, <laughs> all eligible voters, it was 91.6%. Um, so that, we'll celebrate that number for sure, especially during this time when we're not able, um, able to work with everyone and touch base with everyone face to face. Um, and then, I think it was last month, or maybe it was in October, I had shared about the intermediate schools behind the scenes video. Three more videos have been put out for the middle school, the high school, and Arboretum. So if you're interested in seeing some behind the scenes work um, that our staff are doing, those are great videos to check out. And then I'd just like to um, end with an appreciation for our students and families. As I'm sure you know or can imagine, this time of year is a difficult time. <laughs> um, December is a difficult time um, in the field of education. Um, so we just want to appreciate everyone for their continued engagement um, as the excitement builds for winter break. So that's all I have for you tonight. Thank you for your time. Well, I'd yes. like to note that your guys' um, voting numbers for your recent vacation are incredible considering most of the public unions, their numbers have been slowly going down because it is a draining process um, and it's hard to keep people engaged so many years every single year but obviously you guys are being well supported well, I appreciate and obviously that comment. they appreciate what you're doing yeah. nope and we appreciate all of our voters because definitely make the difference actually i don't yeah. recall what was the number of last year is it going up or down is it more or less it's it's about the same i don't recall offhand but i know it was in the 
the upper 90s. Yeah, I know a lot of our public sector unions have, have been slowly going down. I mean, they're still well up there for getting certified, but nowhere near the numbers you're being able to maintain. Yes, we have been, we have great colleagues, so and we work in a good district, so very appreciative. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thanks. Board reports of educational activities or events. Does anyone have anything? Not that we have gone many places. <laughs> I did a Zoom with the uh, Dane County school leaders with Dr. Allen a couple weeks back. Yeah. That was uh, enlightening and some compelling information. Yeah, I watched the video of it and read the one report from the one right. superintendent. I mean, it's... It, it's heartening and disheartening in a way. Obviously, everybody's having the same issues. It's not like any of it's new, and it's not like anyone's found the greatest answer. You know what um, I did have one thing to bring up. Um, some of you probably know the community did a peace walk uh, a couple weeks ago, and they asked um, that various groups within the community produce a video about what the Peace Walk and how its activities meant something to them. The Village has done one, Wanaki Neighborhood Connections has done one. Tom was in the So I was, we were asked if the school board would do one. Um, obviously there are several of us and it might be possible that we could do one, but I didn't think any one single one of us should do it. So I was wondering, maybe after the meeting, those who would be interested, we could talk about doing a joint one with maybe cutting in and out with a setup script or something like that that we could agree on. So if you're interested in doing it, let me know, and we'll try to work something out. And of course, we'll ask Mark to totally write the whole script. Oh, sure. <laughs> What's the uh, concept behind the video? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, um, you, you can probably do a quick Google on the Peace Walk in Wanakee, and they have it. I'll, I'll get you all the details if you want to help. Okay. Uh, the Peace Walk was about inclusion and right. diversity and... and that piece I got, I just didn't know if there's already something to look at, because I, I didn't participate for, for health issues, so... What they're doing for the video is kind of what is your organization doing, or how do you support it, or how do you see these, this issue as a way to just keep the conversation going. Okay. Uh, so next will be Randy with COVID-related updates and recommendations. We have a number of items that fall under this general heading tonight. I'm going to try to move through them as judiciously as I can. Some of these items we, we did spend some time at the medical advisory, so I'm not going to go into quite as much depth this evening because I think most everybody from the board was present um, and or uh, was able to engage in at least what was happening. Um, the data dashboard information in your packet, you will find, I mean, at your seat, you'll find a number of different um, documents. One of them is the, the dashboard that we post online, um, which is uh, the piece that you can find up on our website. And then some of the supporting information, we have two different ways that we are tracking our local data. The one is with this larger spreadsheet. It's the one that has the yellow on it. And that one lines up with our, <laughs> our census track data. And then the new one, which is, again, very small, but it's also the, one with the, the larger one without the color, um, that is following the new DHS um, aggregation of just Wanakee School District and, and COVID numbers. As you heard at the Medical Advisory Committee and was supported by our medical folks, um, you are seeing a decline right now in the incident rates, not only within Wanakee, but across our county. And certainly that's a piece that we're feeling also within the school district. Um, we had a few days last week where we didn't have any COVID letters that we sent out. I think that's a testament to just uh, the, the numbers coming down. You heard um, from our medical folks at Medical Advisory that they feel the same way. Um, right now, our numbers are trending at a level similarly to where we were end of September, early October. Um, so I think that's really positive, particularly as we've come out of Thanksgiving and not knowing exactly what that impact was going to be. Um, 
we feel like we are, are in a much better place. And I think that was articulated within medical advisories group as well. Um, any questions about the data pieces? This is really more just an FYI. I, I think it's just for, for the public to hear one more time. Uh, these numbers are as low as early October? It's, it's what it appears, yeah. When you start to go back, and there's a couple different numbers we track, but we haven't seen numbers this low since we had that spike that right. went up. Um, it, it's pre those. That was really impressive to that's, me. That's positive. The other thing I wanted to, that was, I'm, I'm listening because it shows the totals, but am I reading it correct if I subtract the number of positive cases in close contacts from the number cleared, and that will tell us how many active we have? Are you so, so if you had column one and two, for example, for teachers or for staff, right. you subtract Column three, does that give you the total number of current active? Weird. Yes, I would okay. believe that's right. So right now we have six active staff members who have not been cleared and right. 75 students. Um, They're probably close because they yeah, have I mean, I don't know that varies, yeah. but just since this was yeah, published, this is anyway, right. 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 Yeah. Okay, thank you. Doesn't mean we have 75 students COVID-wise, it's just that you have some groups that have that do hit the close contact pieces. Right, I mean, that, that's a combination. That's right. and so again, I want to give kudos to uh, our, our, our staff and administration for yep. being able to manage this as well as we have. Yes, so we did have a couple classrooms that we had to take a pause just based on kind of just a, a number of incidents that kind of converged in, in, a, in a localized area and we were able to address that. Um, and so those, those students and classrooms will be coming back online here very quickly. Okay. Any other questions with regards to the data? All right, awesome. One of the things that I feel is really is very important and John Kramer is here um, as well is our cleaning and sanitation pieces. Within your packet, you will see, and I'm just going to pull that up to share so that you can see what we're talking about. You get good at Zoom there, Randy? <laughs> What's that? You get good at Zoom? Oh, uh, well, you know, I'm. Where did it go, Randy? Okay. No, the the there, the there we are. Not as good at Zoom as I should be, Jack. Um, the, the document you see in front of you is really uh, trying to summarize really what our, pro what our processes are going to be moving forward with cleaning and sanitization. Um, much of this you've seen before because as part of the requirements of our, of our public health orders, we do have to have a cleaning and sanitation policy which we've had in place since the summer. Um, this is really in addition to that from our perspective and a desire to really want to be as clear and as transparent as possible with the work that we're doing. The items that you see here are just talking about the areas that we feel are important. Um, those things with regards to hand washing, face coverings, social distancing. Those are pieces I know Mark you talked about with Dr. Allen. Those were pieces that Dr. Allen from Harvard University talked about as, as specifically important to the mitigation efforts. So we've had those in place and continue to have them in place. We're also looking at cleaning and sanitation and disinfecting. And just wanting to really kind of, there, there's been a term that's been tossed out there that I think causes a lot of confusion. And it's with regards to the words deep cleaning. Deep cleaning is those type of, the type of cleaning that's going to mitigate disease spread. So it's when we have our electrostatic sprayers that some of you may have used the Clorox type wipes when you walked into the room. All of those constitute deep cleaning in addition to some of the things that we're going to be talking about here tonight with regards to a bucket system that we're going to be utilizing with microfiber towels. Uh, there's also cleaning that we have to continue to do. So cleaning takes place and it has taken place in each of our buildings throughout, throughout time. Now we're at a point where we are just making sure that we are documenting what those are and also including the disinfecting aspects to it. Um, John and his team have done a nice job of using some of our technology to be able to document what's happening in, in each room so that there's a documentation of what's occurred as you've gone through those rooms and moved forward. So you start to look at surfaces, which has really been a focus of ours the last um, 
number of weeks and probably the last couple of months has been talking about what's the emerging data on transmission of COVID from surfaces. You heard Dr. Ranham um, at the last medical advisory committee a month ago say he generally views this as an airborne illness and that certainly it can be transmitted from surfaces but Dr. Allen and others have talked about the pieces with regards to hand washing, social distancing, all of those pieces are very important as well. But the, cha the transmission from surfaces is relatively low. But I still think it's an area that we need to be diligent for our staff, for our students, for our community to make sure we're doing the best job that we can, given that we're bringing in students into our classrooms. So the air versus surface transmission, um, that's definitely been more documented. You see that even within the recommendations that have come out from public health and the CDC, they really are talking about cleaning of surfaces when there's a COVID event or something that's occurred where there's maybe an exposure. And I, we've expanded that even greater um, to be just generally wanting to make sure that we are addressing our surface cleaning pr protocols. We've worked with our chemical company that we work with with all of our cleaning supplies. That we've, and John has identified three different products, um, one being a disinfectant, one being a green cleaner or more of a, an eco-friendly cleaner, and then one being really the use of the microfiber towels with water. And that being a piece that we have 85% impact on mitigating uh, transmission and breaking up of, 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 of matter with, uh, from a surface. Uh, what we are looking at is a system where we have our, our classrooms are cleaned by our custodians. They are disinfected um, every evening. At the elementary level, we'll also have adults that are disinfecting between the cohorts. And then for middle school and high school, this will be a process where we are going to be instilling the, the help of some of our students to help out with the water-based product and the uh, microfiber towels. There will be buckets, and John, if you just want to, while I'm talking, if you just want to show those, what those bucket systems look like. And then we'll also have provided for, in, in each of the classrooms, both the disinfectant and a green cleaner that can be used by the staff member if there is a desire um, to clean or a feeling that an area needs to be cleaned at a, at a higher level. But I think from that perspective, we're able to really um, address some of the input we've received from our medical advisory group and also in line with some of the research and recommendations that are coming out of the CDC and public health. So John, as the, the examples of the bucket system and also the microfiber towel, which would be pre-charged towels, so there's no aerosoling through spraying of materials. And we feel that this would be a, a very <coughs> positive step and a place that puts us at a, at a very high level uh, of cleaning within our schools um, to help to address um, disease spread. So with that, I'd open it up to any questions, but I am looking um, at your um, approval of this process. And if there's any questions or concerns, we'd like to hear that this evening. Hey, Randy, I've got a question. Yes. Uh, on the last bullet point under expectations, uh, um, how, how will the uh, staff monitor and force the flow of traffic in hallways? <laughs> I mean, I, I, are you ha are the staff going to step out in the hallways during class breaks and be there, or? Yeah, I mean, we, we all, yeah, that, that's a great question, Brian. I think when we start to look at just supervision of hallways in general as a general expectation we have for, um, for our staff to be present and be visible, we definitely, and that's part of why I need help with some of the cleaning between um, between the, the, the cohorts of kids coming into a classroom and why we have a water-based system that students could help us with um, because our staff do need to be, be present and more visible with regards to um, helping to make sure that we are addressing the social distancing piece. Now, how are we going to do that, Brian? I think it's a matter of, I think it's... Um, being present, being visible, and laying that out as our expectation and putting forth reminders. Um, but certainly we're gonna have um, teenage kids that we're gonna have to provide those reminders to, particularly um, as we become more comfortable in our environments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Allen talked a lot about uh, you know, air exchanges 
right. you know, sleeping over the air in a, in a particular room, and I thought it was two or three, two to four times an hour. Right. Does that sound right? Yeah, he was talking year. about the circulation rates of the air. And I know that, John, you've worked with North American Mechanical, and we've maximized our outside air intake. We've also added that pinpoint ionization system, which absolutely helps with um, any of the pieces and the ionizing of those items within the air. It also has a positive impact on things on the surface. But Brett, I know Mark, geez. <laughs> John, um, you have more information with regards to that than I do. As far as the circulation of air, I know that. Yeah, I was just wondering how, you know, do we know what the expectation is to cert to exchange the air of a particular room how many times an hour or a day yeah sure Brian the, uh, of course the buildings were built within with code you know according to the number of ex air exchanges per hour so I can definitely um, get what was designed for the building for you guys and of course that was built with the capacity of students in mind that are supposed to be in the building, so we're obviously going to exceed that because of the limited number of students in the building. So right away, we're at least double the amount of air turnovers that are required for the capacity of the buildings. Do you have any idea what that is for a general classroom, just as a ballpark? I would say an average across the district is going to be about 10 times. Okay. Some rooms may be four times per hour, some rooms may be 12, but I, I was told today by our mechanical contractor that on average, we probably see eight to 10 times per hour. Very good, Brian. Thanks. Thank you. A couple points. So first with the air pull, I can communicate a little bit with John. Um, it might be helpful to know, particularly with our older buildings, uh, a sample classroom or two, because again, from the Dr. Brown presentation, if it's on the little side, just even lifting the windows for part of the classroom here to allow some in where we, we know there may be some structural issues. For example, uh, the, the oldest part of the uh, of the Heritage Annex, you know, right. that, may, that, that may be considerably lower, uh, something to consider. Uh, yeah. Just so we can get a, a better idea if we do need to do something artificially by, you know, within the classroom. Out. And we can look at that market, North American Mechanical, as far as how that looks in some of our other buildings. But we also have to remember we've also put that ionization system in exactly. every place exactly. Exactly. As, a, as a further mitigation effort. The other question I had with this was uh, well, two things. One, if we're going to put a bullet in here that says this is uh, a, a, an expectation or a possibility. For example, bullet number four under middle school, high school, uh, teachers may disinfect to the greatest extent possible. There's sort of an expectation they're going to. And I, if, if we're not expecting the teachers to do it, I don't think we should be saying they, they may do it or the expectation they may. Uh, um, if it's written, there's sort of an inner obligation to feel you have to do it. And so um, if if that's really something we're looking more for students to do at, within at the end of the classroom, I'd rather see it stated that way, uh, personally. Um, and as an adjunct to that, I am concerned about the pragmatic, not of the high school, because according to the schedule I've seen, they have 15 minute passing time. Mm -hmm. At the middle school, there's a five minute passing time and then only a 30 minute class. At least at the one I looked at that was sent out on November 30th to the families to get a sense. Now, I don't know if that's changed. I think they've shortened up that passing time as I'm looking at Annie right now mm -hmm. at the high school. So part of the issue, let, let me speak to that, your, your point. It, is my expectation for every teacher to clean their classroom between the cohort? No. The reason being exactly what, what um, Brian talked about and what Val brought up at Medical Advisory. I need staff being, because it is a shortened time frame, because we felt if we expanded it longer, you are going to now run into more issues with social distancing and kids congregating. If you are dealing with a shorter passing time, they're getting from point A to point B at a quicker point. Um, but I need staff to be thinking about just their preparations for their next group coming in, and also supervising their kids um, as, as they're passing between the hallways, etc. 
So this process is here really for a couple of reasons. One, um, I do need to, one, we, we have a, a system that, and we have research that's showing you're not getting a great deal of spread from surfaces. When you look at other right. districts that are having students in place, they don't have this system in place in, in most districts. This is a piece I feel that we are going above and beyond because I think it's important. The second part is the level of spread from the surface is, is negligible. And the biggest thing that we are going to have available is hand sanitizer at each of the building, at each of the classrooms, so that kids can take part in that because hand washing is an extremely important piece of this as well. But the piece that we, the reason for the three different buckets, one for the students, and two, if you do have a staff member, I don't want to have a situation where a staff member wants to go to a higher level, has the ability to do it, and we don't have the products there. Right. So I want to make sure that that is covered. And if there was ever a point where, I don't know the situation specifically, they felt one surface needed to be cleaned at a different level, that those opportunities are available to them. So that was, that's the rationale. As long as they understand that piece, that's yep. That's yep. Right. and that's how we'll be presenting it. And then the third issue still is, um, I mean, there's time between now and this potential opening to look at the schedule. And the information I got from Times was online on the, on the high school web page and the middle school web page. And so if that's changed, I, I, then there's misinformation out there. Yeah, we'll, we'll at, take at least look. concerned. But if it is accurate, I, I'm still concerned about isn't, is there a way to add five minutes or three minutes to each of the middle school classes to provide that student cleaning time if that's what they need to do? Okay. You're asking this to happen in a 30 minute classroom is. I think the class has changed to 40 minutes. I, I At don't. least on the web page. Yeah. I believe they're 40 minutes now. They, right. they had 10 passing and 35 minutes. At the high school. Now I think, no, at the middle. Would you bring it back to uh, the January board meeting on what the guest schedule is? Sure. I'm yeah. sure. Yep. You know, uh, yep. that way we're not the. We'll absolutely bring that. We're going to be talking about our instructional piece anyway, so that makes sense. Okay. But I can absolutely bring that back. The I'm point sure is that this practical for, for everybody that was, yeah, that's, that's The, the point we're trying to get at with this policy is yep. trying to, I feel it's important to do something. Right. Many places are doing nothing. And I felt that this is in place to, uh, to address that need. The microfiber towel was an important piece as part of some of the research that John did. So. Do we need to uh, approve this? Or? I would like this to be approved and we would include it as an addendum to our cleaning policy. I would make the uh, motion to uh, approve the, the policy as uh, presented and make it an amendment to our cleaning policy. Second. Second by Mike. Any further discussion or questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, thank you very much, I appreciate that. And now uh, that takes us to the reopening planning for grades five and 12, yeah, the survey results. Yeah, just a, a couple things. First of all, at 4.15 today, we did have public health came out with new requirements and recommendations um, per school reopening. Generally, what you're gonna find from this document is the requirements are just speaking to things like we just talked about. They're really addressing just the policies we have to have in place, and some of those practices which we've already accomplished. You can see a copy of this in front of you. The re recommendations, what they've done is they've moved away from the um, incident rate metrics, which was similar to, I think, what you heard from Dr. Allen. And you can see in the public health document why they have a rationale for why they're moving away from those. And part of it is, is based on just the putting an effort towards the mitigation efforts in school and that if those things are in place and done well and done with fidelity, that we have, um, then we can do a good job of controlling disease spread within that situation. So the recommendations that came out here tonight or this afternoon, I still have to go through them in a little bit more depth, but generally I would say that they are in line with really the work that we're already doing. When you look at the, the metrics that were in place as we started to move forward with um, third and fourth grade, that was outside of those recommendations from public health. 
our recommendation to be focusing on uh, bringing 5 to 12 back at the semester was outside of that. So from my perspective, this doesn't change anything as far as the plans that we're doing. It just basically, I think, aligns generally with some of the thoughts and conversations we've been having. So that's just kind of a, an answer. Some of the pieces that we've been putting in place with regards to the planning aspects, um, our team has done a great job of jumping in and trying to push forward with making sure that we are, have all of our pieces ready for um, starting the, at, at the second semester. We have in your packet, you will see our survey results. So you're basically running that 20, 25-ish percent um, with regards to wanting to stay remote, the remainder of the students wanting to return um, to an in-person in um, hybrid approach. We anticipate some of those numbers may shift a bit as we get closer to the start, um, just because I know that there has been, particularly at the high school, wanting to kind of secure your spot in a hybrid and if then being able to do an assessment as we get closer if you want to stay remote. So we anticipate a small percentage change there, but generally the numbers that we've been able to um, secure through these surveys have allowed um, our principals to move forward with their planning with regards to their cohorting, regarding transportation, and I know that there's some additional work that's happening after break that will finalize and solidify this so that we are in a place where everything is ready to roll forward um, as we come to the second semester. So I don't really have anything that's really a more specific update than that, letting you know kind of that we've put the survey out. That's an critical piece for us um, to, um, for our planning aspect. We did receive some feedback that it was challenging for parents to fill out early, given that this was a couple months in advance, but it was a piece that we felt we needed to do at that time frame. And if parents were on the fence, we recommended they sign up for the hybrid and then they can make a better decision at that point when they get to the, yeah. I think when you look at these uh, numbers, they're very consistent with uh, what we've uh, seen throughout the year. And I think it's really important that uh, we really focus on trying to get these kids back in school. You know, Dr. Fauci and everybody is, is really talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a question. When we have kids in hybrid, kind of goes along with the parent comment that they've chosen to keep their hybrid kid at home for virtual. Yep. Is that going to be an issue, the back and forth, or is that something manageable? Um, and, and that's part of what we're going to talk about in our next agenda item, too, is just to help out with some of the absentee pieces. Okay. But what we've stated is that you, can, uh, you can't jump back and forth between the models. And you, can, you can go from um, in-person to virtual. The pieces that we had after, with regards to like Thanksgiving, where parents choosing to really not change their model per se, but just keep their child home. Now with the being virtual, there were also opportunities where you could engage at different levels. Through either the asynchronous pieces or from um, some parents working directly with the teacher and then finding ways that they could um, get other in, enhanced learning through Zoom. So that's a piece that we're going to be talking about at the next kind of agenda item, but the whole point is we can't jump between right. unless we're at items like at the quarter or the semester. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. I guess the only comment I want to make is I, I saw those recommendations from Dane County come out. I mean, I, I, I read them over and I want to give credit to the administration here for everything that they've done because you could have just distilled down what their recommendations were by saying, just do it quantitative from August. Um, I mean, their recommendations literally are reopen schools using a phased approach, starting with elementary students, keeping a virtual option, risk mitigation, track COVID-19 cases and have a plan for contact tracing. It, their recommendations are literally exactly what we've done. So kudos to the planning, the medical ad hoc committee, Everybody does we're working on this because if they had just co-opted what we did, that's basically what they put in their recommendations. And, and that was my, my high level read was that it, there, this really lines up well with what we're doing. Again, a point of clarification, we know it, but I think the public just also needs to hear because there's some that still think that like a six foot spacing is a negotiable number that we're choosing to pick on 
that's non-negotiable. That's that has to be followed, and and because we're in Dane County, and so uh, that that's a piece I think a few people still don't understand that the local school districts in Dane County do have to follow these guidelines, and that's one that, that that's one of them. Right, and, but, and, and that's the, there's two parts to this 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 document: the requirements and the recommendations. Right. The recommendations are about how you move forward and what grades you can open, etc. But the requirements are part of the order, and those include ensuring um, students and employees with face coverings at least six feet apart to the greatest extent possible. That ex the greatest extent possible means that incidental times when you are when you are not. Right. Uh, but that's the piece that that really is preventative of opening up schools completely with all kids every day, all day. Exactly. So I think that's a th thank you for bringing that thank up. Thank you. Do we know whether or not there is any movement on changing that number? Because right. I've heard rustling about that in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, there's been some conversations, particularly as you've listened to some of the folks with from like the, the Harvard model and some other places that have talked about three feet. Yeah. Um, as our question for public health last week was, is there any um, forecast of them changing from six feet to three feet and their answer was a definitive no. Mm -hmm. They definitely were moving to do, put forth the requirements and recommendations that you see in front of you tonight, but that wasn't one that there was going to be any movement on at this point. Now I hope at some point they'll re revisit that, but mm -hmm. as of today that still stands. I would like to mention that our lawyer member on our board did not tell us that we should copyright our procedures so that we could help finance this. But, uh, Sorry. That was a mistake on our part. I guess I just want to uh, assure the board that we are moving forward. These folks here, I mean, Jeff, Brian, Tim, and their teams have done a nice job uh, with really trying to get everything in place. I talked to Steve Summers today. Um, with regard, he feels transportation is, a, is in a very good place. He feels good about the plan and how that would, would move forward. Um, I know a Annie takes on a lot of roles in her communication role, often is trying to corral some of us to make sure we get all of our communications in one place. So um, yeah, they've done a great job getting us ready for that. There are some things to do after we get back from break to finalize that, but my purpose here tonight was just to kind of bring forward to you what those survey results were update you on really what came out at 415 today and then just assure you that we are moving forward and if there's any questions they're present here tonight to answer those in case you um, have any inquiries that you want to ask okay. seeing none we'll move on to reviewing practices related to student quarantine and absence yeah, so I'm going to ask uh, Amy Johnson and Sheila Wire to going to come forward. I think they're probably in the back room or the side room. Um, this is really with regards to some of the um, public comments you heard this evening as we as we started off the meeting, with regards to um, how we're coding absences, how we're recording absences. Um, our administrative team met uh, earlier in, in the beginning of the of the year to really start to think about. COVID-related absences and what those looked like, how we would quantify those within our system, and then situations and conversations with regards to um, like the post-Thanksgiving piece. It wasn't specifically articulated here, but it was a conversation that we had prior to that happening if a family chose to um, pull their child out of the hybrid temporarily as a result of that. So what you see in your packet is a, a document that outlines what that procedure is. And it was just requested that we bring this forward tonight to clarify that. So I've asked Amy Johnson and Sheila Wyatt. I appreciate both of them being here. Um, Sheila works with this on a much more closer basis than either Amy or I do. So if we're able to pull that item up, I can, I'll do a sharing screen. And if you can find their document, Rebecca, please. And Sheila, thanks for being here. If you can kind of walk through a little bit of the conversations and the work that went into the student quarantine and other absences, and then just really what our lo recent conversations have been with regards to um, parents who've made a choice like after the holiday for, for, for 
keeping the child home of precautionary measures? Sure. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, we really knew that going into this year, we needed more coding within our system to accommodate for the different absence reasons. Um, and we have an obligation to know when students are actually on-site attending, attending virtually, and all of those in-between pieces. So we wanted to merge those. And also with the intention that if students are absent due to COVID, it really isn't a worry for parents around truancy or any of those pieces. And it's definitely a learning process for us as we go through this year. So we have attendance secretaries in all of our buildings, also working closely with our health secretaries as well as central office here when we do get a report for close contact or a positive. So if you look at some of the coatings that we've added, we have everything for absence due to a close contact. What if that child had a positive test? One of them, that, um, that third item in there, absence voluntary, earlier when you were talking in the meeting about parents who might wonder about keeping kiddos out because maybe they were at a family gathering or they're concerned. That's where that one falls in, that CVE, that COVID voluntary exclusion. And then there's also absence with symptoms. All of these are new codes for us this year. And again, with the idea of not penalizing. And the different codes also have implications for how we go about planning for kiddos. So if you did have somebody, if you flip to the other side or scroll down if you're hard copy or if you're electronic. How we plan for kiddos for instruction depends on the situation. Um, if a student is a close contact or does have a positive test, we do a learning plan that may include different items or different ways to meet their needs. And that will vary based upon the age of the student, that student is a learner, what's coming up in the curriculum, what makes the most sense, and it's fairly, very easily communicated with parents. Um, one of the things we can't do is if a parent is doing that voluntary piece on the other side, that absence um, is voluntary, the CVE, we don't necessarily come up with a whole new learning plan because that is a lot to be bobbing in out of. When a teacher might be in hybrid and have a class, and they have a streaming kid and they have two or three doing asynchronous work. So it's a lot to manage for that teacher. Um, so those learning plans are really reserved um, for again, kiddos who are a close contact or who have a positive test. So that's really that high level nutshell version um, of what all of the new codes mean. And I'm here to answer questions you might have. So we heard from two families that had kids that stayed home the week after Thanksgiving of COVID words. Both kids were live streamed into the classroom, but they were marked absent. Um, now, I don't know if this absent was consent. Is that, so if someone were, could you scroll back up, please? So the voluntary one. Yep. Is that an excuse to absent, even though it's marked as an absence? So they're, they're certainly excused in terms of they're excused, you don't worry about truancy, any of that piece. As far as them having streaming under that, that's not something that we're doing. But what I will tell you is, did it happen? Um, because a teacher kind of put that together. It did, and we're learning. Um, making sure we're getting consistent in doing that because sometimes you don't see the very big picture of it. So that's not something that we're doing right now because then for teachers, when you decide, I'm gonna keep my kids home for these three days and I have this and I have that, it gets very difficult to balance all of that programming for that one teacher. So we're really keeping it to close contact and to positive testing. They still get their asynchronous work. Um, they still have those pieces. I think part of what's what's occurred, and, and, and it's a conversation that Amy, you and I have had specifically, is is whenever a child is gone from a classroom, whether it be from um, a, a parent choosing to pull them out for for multitude of reasons, um, every teacher meets that child's needs, but may do it a little bit differently. And in this case, I think that's what what you found. I think our our initial pr pr proposal here was was that this would be 
um, wanting to make sure that we were addressing needs of, of kids, but also realizing that there's enough nuance here. Mm -hmm. our, our remote teachers have high class sizes already. So I'm not trying to add to that. We're also trying to see, particularly when we look at our, at our younger kids, that being able to just live stream in isn't necessarily um, intuitively set up in every single classroom to do that. So some of this, as Sheila said, was set up by the teacher saying, this works in my environment, but generally as an, as an elementary approach, it wasn't part of the piece administratively we were putting out there. And I think that's part of what's caused some challenges is, is it's happened in some areas and not in others, and parents are feeling like, I don't want to be considered absent when we're doing different pieces right. of the program. Right. But I also can't differentiate between, I wasn't in the live Zoom, but I was in the asynchronous, so I was there half days. Just the, the, the process of that is, is, that's not where we're putting our, our efforts, and we're honestly, it's not a piece that, I understand the coding aspect and the concern from a parent's view, but it's certainly not a piece that is concerning to us from a level of attendance, truancy, etc., which is some of the reasons that we track attendance. And it, it, it sounds like it could be just misunderstanding the parent what that, what that thing means. So I think that's, that's really correctable. In terms of Christmas coming up, I do think it would be helpful for our families to get a reminder of what happens if they choose to quarantine because they were away and there's a potential they may have come in contact and don't know it. So uh, they have a better idea when they come back what their options are. I, it might be foresightful to do something like that. And I think too one of the things I, I sometimes hear is that absence is such a negative thing. And in this case when somebody is taking a precaution I don't know. I mean, we're not viewing it we don't have that lens administratively that that's a negative thing at mm -hmm. all. Um, we do need to code things a certain way because if it was a child who was in hybrid that isn't in the building, that may need to happen for that particular part of the session for certain because we have some obligations about whether they were here or not here, but it doesn't mean that that absence is a negative. Did you have a question again? Yeah, and it was kind of sad. I just. It's the communication to the parents that I, it appears to be really important that, you know, when they come in in advance and say, I'm going to keep them out for a week, great, we support that, but they will be marked absent because of these reasons. I mean, they need to know up front that you support it, but it, it's an absence. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think communication is most important. So let's so just kind of pull these out or put this together in the last month or so, or uh, or has this been out for the entire year? The CVE, September? the voluntary piece is newer as that came up because you learn and grow and you go, aha, uh -huh, we could do something about this. But my understanding, and I can let Amy speak to this too, um, because I wasn't present for that, but that this was done before school started um, in these codes because we need them in infinite campus and there's some back work that be belongs to that. So it was before school started. Yep. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is maybe the suggestion of a good communication piece before the break just so parents have some clarity. I'm seeing some head nods and I'm sure that we can pull something together. And I think too reassuring parents, it's not necessarily negative to see right. absence, right. but it is a responsibility for how we record that. Does that sound good? Yeah, yeah I mean, going back to Jack's point, this was, this was early on because all of our absences have codes within our student management system. And with the nuances of COVID, we created some additional ones. And then as Sheila said, we've added ones as we've had to kind of nuance our way through it. I think it's just kind of an appreciation for the preliminary work you did to get this thing going in this summer. The problem as an individual, it doesn't matter to you until you have to use it. Right. <laughs> right. And then you don't understand at that point. So it, it's just a matter of, I mean, you guys did what you needed to do. It's just a matter of understanding once, it, once, once it's your kid. And so, again, thank you for what you guys are talking Thank you. We'll, we'll work on that. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Sheila.
Next is the co-curricular winter sports. Yeah, I, I added this item with co-curriculars back to our agenda this time. Partially because I felt it was important for us to kind of have an understanding of what's changed since the last time we were together. And also just to let you know some of the things that we are doing in response to that. And then also as a clarification point based on the motion that was made at the last, at the last board meeting. I mean, generally what we approved at the last meeting was to, and this is with regards to, we allowed the uh, low risk sports to continue to participate and to um, compete. And for the medium and high risk sports to follow the public health Madison Dane County gui guidelines um, allow competition once the numbers are down, a Dane County League is formed, um, or no earlier than January 11th. So a few things have happened since this motion was put in front of you. Um, I've had some follow-up conversations with Aaron, and then we have Marcus and Dana who also work in our, in our basketball arena who've worked, who've worked with some of our other coaches. This does clarification as these things have moved forward. Um, a lot of the last order, order number 10 that came through was quite vague. It didn't give us a lot of direction as far as what it meant for us as a school. It allowed us to keep our instructional programs moving forward, but it really focused in on group size. Where group size squeezed us was with regards to practices, contact days, all of those aspects of some of the it wasn't the enhanced work or the instructional piece because that was exempt from the order. It was anything else outside of that. So anything we've done for months with the weight room, things we were doing in the pool, and then any of our contact days, practices, et cetera, were impacted by that. Um, we worked with public health, and I know Aaron's group of athletic directors across the county looked for clarity and then they went back and clarified some things that we were able to do. Um, some of the things that were, were individual sign-ups for things like the weight room and the pool, and we're ap actually able to do something similar within our gym spaces where Marcus, for example, could have a, a student sign up and have a time one-on-one -on -one, one with, with him. Those are all allowable by public health and we're in the process of kind of working through that a lot. But the piece that's coming in front of us now is that order number 10, the last day is tomorrow. So on the 16th at 12.01, that order no longer exists. So I'm anticipating, and you got, we have the school reopening items that came out today. I anticipate tomorrow we're gonna get either a revision of order 10, an extension of it of, of some nature. What that is gonna look like with regards to group sizing, I don't know. Public health has been very tight-lipped with regards to that. But should they provide um, greater opportunity to get back to the point where we were last month, where uh, these gentlemen and, the, and, their, and their cohorts within the other sports were able to practice, then our, the, 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 or, the motion you provided last month gives us the latitude to do that. So we're really waiting to see what does that order say so that they can kind of start to re-engage with their students and their, and their players. In the event that it doesn't change, we're looking at some things within the order that we can do, which might be very much one-on-one -on -one almost. But keeping those connections with kids, I think, is important. The one piece that was, was brought forward um, by our coaches to us and it's a piece I felt it needed to come back here to the board because it was part of your motion, was that you gave different criteria for when competition could start. One being a Dane County League, that's not occurring. Um, the second being COVID numbers dropped, which they have. We've definitely seen that, that reduction drastically from where we were here a month ago. And then not earlier than January 11th. And the, if, if things were allowed um, per um, our public health to get our kids back practicing, we'd like to at least ha have some, a conversation with the board. Are you into, would you be amenable to a January 4th, which is the Monday we would come back from Christmas break, um, with regards to that being the earliest start date for the season as opposed to the 11th. So that's a piece that um, 
I didn't have the authority to, uh, to address. I think we've worked through everything else, waiting for public health pieces, but I wanted to bring that back for consideration. Um, the reason the coach has brought it forward to me was because, and I think Marcus, you, you kind of articulated it, is for girls basketball, for example, um, the end of your season is the first week in February. Yep. And then immediately you're jumping into a period where it, it's the postseason. And this just gives an extra week in the event that, that we can um, do some things with our students. So that's a piece I wanted to bring forward, give a little background of what's happened since the last time we were together, and then bring that forward for at least discussion or consideration. And I asked Marcus and Dana to be here just in case anybody had questions about anything, as opposed to me trying to answer them or Aaron trying to speak for them. It gives them an opportunity to answer to them. And one of the uh, one of the things that we talked around the board uh, about the uh, holiday season, you know, we talked about uh, Thanksgiving. Everybody's concerned with uh, traveling. You know, more people are going to be traveling for uh, for the uh, the Christmas theoretically uh, because it's a longer season. Uh, and everything we've talked about, and the reason we push things back is because we're concerned about that. And here we're saying, okay, it's okay to uh, start engaging right after the uh, right after the uh, Christmas break. Uh, you know, the other concern I've got is it's not safe for us to get back in school until the end of January. But you know, we can sit down and say it's safe to get these kids together in groups. And I think when you when you talk uh, to uh, you know, some of the people on the uh, medical advisory committee, you know, it may not be the uh, sports, but it's the gathering around the uh, sports that uh, create the uh, problem. Um, <clears throat> the thing I think we need to remind ourselves of, we, we chose to go to the second semester it's not necessarily because it's going to be safe for them. We don't know if it's going to be safe for them. It was the schedule of not wanting to do it right after Thanksgiving because of a potential surge. And then looking at coming back after Christmas and the semester's ending and you have semester exams. And then, so let's start when we actually start. The, the, the discussion wasn't wait till January 26th because that might be safer than January 10th or 12th. And so... You know, Mark, I understand that, but I'm then not, one of the I'm things not, that we I'm should have done then is start on uh, January 4th. I'm not finished. Start. If you let me. Go for it. And so I think it's important that we keep our rationale clear and We did vote to go on January, I, I think it's, it's the 11th or 12th, to give a week's lead in there because of a potential holiday, holiday uh, surge. Um, I certainly understand why the coaches, particularly the girls coach, with their earlier tournament time would appreciate that extra week. And, um, I'd be willing to at least consider letting that program start a week earlier to meet their, because of the tournament being expedited a week earlier than the other sports, some consideration for that. Um, that's what I was going to say. And, and I just use that as an example. I don't know where the other ones fall there, right. Mark. That was just extrapolated out. So I guess my point is I'd rather not just separate out and try and do one offs on, on sports. It's kind of trust them all or or not and, and I, I think and this, I is, this, this is this is this is brought forward with the spirit of just of bringing forth that 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 thought that concern and really and then dave asked the question that medical advisory we had an answer from that um, but i i think there's uh, it, it's a challenging piece to know what the right answer is we did not see a surge after thanksgiving i thought we, you might there was a challenge with that what are you going to see after Christmas? I don't know. 
but that's that's the spirit of where this is coming from given our little bit of our history and just given some of the background is this something that you're amenable to thinking about or you're comfortable with what you have in front of you other questions and comments I, oh, I, I guess just uh, correct me if i'm wrong we are again talking about athletics that are solely going to travel outside of the county because the county rules preclude right. medium and high risk floors from competing at all. So we are again talking about people just leaving the county, doing their thing, and then coming back here again. Correct? That's what it is. That which, we know, which we know they're already doing anyway right. because they're going and having competitions already. It's yeah. just not school sanctioned. Right. Yeah, the boys team went to Lodi. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, I got, I got and, a, and as you heard, dad. From our medical advisory group, you heard one of the um, John Weiss shared that his experience talking to kids is that they are moving, traveling, etc. So y you have all of those things happening as well. And as a former coach, you know, I really empathize with the student athletes. Mm -hmm. They're proud of wearing their purple. They'd much rather wear the purple their high school program than whatever colors they're wearing on their weekend tournaments because that's all they work, they're, they're allowed to do. And, um, you know, my heart tells me that one week isn't going to make a massive difference to our, to our district. And um, if we want to make it simple for the athletic program that we say all of them come back to four, um, I'd make a motion that we do that. Yeah, all that, what, what this would actually is, is stating is that if public health allows them to, so if public health tomorrow says they can practice, they can start that up in, in the matter equivalent with whatever public health says. Yep. What this says, and this is really a piece really primarily for, for Aaron, is as he's looking, because he's got to be planning be well ahead to be planning where, where these competitions would be and with whom, it would allow him to, instead of the earliest day being January 11th to the 4th. Um, Brian, Brian, I think Brian wants to talk. Oh, sorry. Oh, right. oh he raised Here. his hand. Sorry, I wasn't oh, Sorry, watching. Brian. It's all right. Um, Aaron, and what can you explain? Should... Should... I mean, shouldn't be. We're what? still not getting you. Hang on. Hold on a second. He is being heard through the system. The speaker not be off. The rest of the world gets to hear you. <laughs> the 65 people watching us on YouTube know what you're saying. Maybe one of them will text us and let us know. There, there we go. Go ahead, Brian. All right, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> now you're doing a phone commercial. That's right. So, Aaron, explain to me the postseason tournament for both basketball, boys and girls. What do they need to play a certain number of games to qualify? Um, there is, yeah. Do they need to start a week earlier to be able to qualify? What type of tournament are they actually going to run? So, the, the tournament, it's we're in the tournament. That's about getting enough games to be prepared um, because we can simulate, and the coaches can tell you about this, we can do things in practice, but there's nothing like playing the game to actually prepare you for the game. Um, you know, so that's one of the reasons we would like to be able to get out and compete to get a extra, some extra games in, but also it gives us flexibility when trying to find games, because uh, whether it's myself or these coaches, uh, whether them reaching out to other teams and other schools, having that extra week of oh no, I don't, you know, I don't have anything open the week of the 11th, but I'm looking for a game on January 6th. Well, there's some flexibility for us. Uh, another example, um, and I brought it up back in our other meeting, was wrestling is only allowed dual meets this year. We're not allowed to do tournaments in wrestling. And they can only do one meet a week. There has to be at least six different days between their meets. And with where their tournament starts, that means we only get two dual meets before the, the tournament season. So someone like Sam Lorenz, 
who's a four times or three time state entrant trying to be a four time state entrant, uh, potentially our first ever in Wanaki history, is if there's a, a cancellation, he's going to have a match before he walks into WIA regionals and sectionals to qualify for state. And that's not setting, not just him, but that's not setting up any of our wrestlers or our other athletes up for success. So if we're about excellence, we're committed to being an, a, the best program we can be, we need these games to prepare these kids for the tournament series so we can perform at, at the highest level. Um, and I think that's what the coaches behind me would say too. Having that extra week is big in terms of being able to uh, schedule with other teams because it gives us that extra, you know, those extra five days, six days of that week flexibility of finding a match for us to compete with. Because it's not just about we have that week or we have that date open, it's about finding that school, that, that other school that also does, that isn't you know, all the way up at Bayport High School, which is two and a half hours away from here. I mean, it's not something we can do. So we, it, the more flexibility we have, the, the better chance we have of creating a, 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 a good experience for these kids. Did you have a follow-up, Brian? Uh, no, the only, the, the only concerns I have is as I kept reading the, the COVID protocols, that was put out by you guys, uh, the guidelines. There's a lot of contraindications there where you say, we're not doing this. Two lines later, you say, but if we do this. So I, there's some cleanup that needs to be done on those policies for me to feel comfortable. Um, that's why I was just asking if there was a certain number of games that needed to be played. Um, and, I, and I get to be, be able to be prepared to play and be in shape to play is different. Practicing is different than playing. So, um, but there are some clarifications that, that need to be made on this, that you're saying two different things. So um, to make me comfortable to, to say yes. But. We didn't allow medium or high risk sports in the fall to travel outside of county either, did we? The only, the only we didn't thing allow we did was uh, for the state. But that was only for low risk sports, right? Low risk sports. We didn't low allow risk. medium or high risk sports at all. So we're saying we'll allow medium or high risk to do it now when state and that numbers are demonstrably worse than they were in fall? That's a decision for yeah. the board. Medium, medium and high risk sports in the fall went to the fall to spring model. Okay. Yeah. So that was one difference. I think our winter sports don't have that option. So like fall is not totally done, it could still happen in spring. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I'd like to ask you a question. On these guidelines, who, who drafted them? Was it just you, Aaron, or was it you with so the coaches? That's based, well, it's based off the model that Edgewood is using that they implemented and then we shared out and we had some coaches look them over too. So we. Okay. They're not complete yet. They're still a work in progress. So we still got some, some word smithing, some other things to do on them. But it'd be something we'd be sharing with Randy and sort of the COVID team in the district office, like we've done with our safety plan. So I think on just a couple points, um, the the very first one is it says all athletes will commit to only participating in their winter sports season. So that means they would not be in clubs or anything if they wanted to participate with one and keep. Yes. Okay. And the other one had to do with that whoever provided trains, parents should remain in their car and not come into the building or the practice area. So we're saying no fans, no observers. So, so what you'll find, team. so what you'll find in, in almost, I should say almost, in most cases, fans are not being allowed into events regardless of the location. Right. Um, some gymnasiums have, do allow, or, or some schools are allowing, say, two guests or things like that. We would, but in most cases, they're not allowing fans. Um, what that's about is about pick up and drop off. I'm just off the top of my head thinking of what you're looking at. That was, mm -hmm. I think that's what that one is addressing, pick up and drop off at practice, is, is they should stay out there. They shouldn't come into the building. I, I will say that the, the it, 
doesn't specify practice, but it's but it the one thing that medical advisory committee because I I knew this was coming up. I specifically asked them, are they still feeling the way they were last month? And I, I really noted what Dr. Random said, which is the spread and stuff they're seeing out of sporting events is almost entirely the parents and the spectators. It's not the kids on the court. So I got to admit, I feel part of what's down here, it, you're saying there that they shouldn't come into the practice area, but then if we sit there and have a game, then if the school that we go to is outside Dane County, which we can't do it, they can't have the game anyway. Um, and they allow fans, then we would say, okay, go ahead in. It, it seems counterintuitive to say it's unsafe in one spot and it's safe in another, because it's not. And actually, Dane County is having lower numbers than almost all the counties around us. So in a weird way, we're doing exactly the opposite of what Dr. Random said, and we're increasing the risk, yet it seems odd we won't let them spectate in our own school, but we'll go ahead and let them spectate in a county that has worse numbers than we do. If, uh, to me, I would want to see those match. We either say no spectators or we say spectators, and if we say spectators, we know what we're voting on. Uh, I'll admit, I'm, I'm still always where I've always been. I'm not going against the doctors. And they were all still, now they were saying, I, I was surprised, they made that differentiation because that's what's random seeing in the clinic right here in Wanakee. Mm -hmm. And I think we should follow that. But that's where I'm at. And I think you referenced, Aaron, within what Dave just pointed out for the practices, you're trying not to get parents just drop their kid off and leave, and then you've got a cluster of kids hanging out outside the door before the door is open to let them in. But I think that was part of the control of the flow of kids was part of what you wrote in there. Yeah. Uh, Mark? David, you make a great point, but we can't control what happens off school grounds. And what Dane County did was followed by exactly what Dr. Ryan described, and that's going to continue regardless. So that piece is happening and going to happen. And so to me, it, 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 if we say they can begin one week early, we might actually be able to do a better job of controlling because they understand the issues and they're, they're getting a chance to be on the school team. We can't stop them if they go into the gym, uh, but we can't stop them if they're on the weekend tournament going into the gym. It's still, all that's still going to come back no matter what we decide tonight. And since that part isn't going to change, I'd like to see us give the kids a chance and start, follow the recommendation begin on January 4th. And um, I'd like to make a motion to that effect. So you're making a motion for this policy with one week earlier. Just yes. to make that clear? Yes. Okay, is there a second for I'll that motion? I'll second that. Second from Judy. And this is all contingent upon the next order allowing... Allowing it to be. Exactly. As, as well, I think that, as the, no. order, the order allows practice. Right, if the order allows practice. Right. The order is going to start the practice. You're not going to be, correct me if I'm wrong, you're not able to really start the season unless you're practicing. So we're, yeah, so we, like right now, we, we can do the one-on-one -on -one practices. We can call those, consider those practices. We're required to have, just I'll use basketball since both coaches are here, they have to have seven different days of practice before their first competition. So whenever, whenever we have our first official practice, we have to have seven practices before we can have our first competition. So what that practice looks like will depend on the next update from public health. It may, you know, so that's that's what we're waiting for. So, so what you're saying, Aaron, and, and thanks for, for clarifying that, should public health not lift their current order, then it's going to have to be almost that one-on-one -on -one with the coaches. Yeah. You're still going to have to have seven touches with each of the kids before you can have an opportunity to be participating. By WIA rule, you have to have seven different days of practice. Not each kid has to have seven different practices. Yeah, 
So regardless of what we do tonight, Dane County doesn't allow practicing. That date means nothing until they allow team practices to begin. So practice. Okay. okay. We have to have seven team practices in order to compete. No, we have to have seven different days of practice. What we define, we define what a practice is. Okay. The coaches define what a practice is. So with what's allowed right now by public health are those one-on-one -on -one practice, what I'll call practices, are allowed. We can, when I say we, I mean us, the school, can say that's the start of girls basketball practice. That's the start of boys' basketball practice. Okay. We have seven days of that, seven seven days of that, and then we can compete. Yeah. So then theoretically you could have one kid, you could uh, have one kid one-on-one -on -one today, another kid one-on-one -on -one tomorrow, another kid one-on-one -on -one third day, and would that be considered three practices? By the letter of the, of the rule, yes. But you need to remember, we have 14 legal, the 14 legal duties of a coach. One is the duty to prepare. And we, we'll, we have to decide if that kid is fit physically, musculoskeletal, cardio, cardio-wise, to actually be on the, on the field or on the court in, in their case. So, yes, by the letter of the law, that would technically be considered three different pra days of practice. But I don't think you would find our coaching staffs being, yeah, we can put we can put our whole team on when we only have one kid practice those different days. So we have, so each sport is slightly different. Basketball is seven, wrestling's eight, we have gymnastics has twenty, has to have twenty different days of practice. So each sport requirement is different. And those number of days is determined by the WIA Medical Advisory Board on how much time does a coach need to evaluate whether or not those players are ready to compete? The reason why they say seven different days, they don't say each kid has to have those, is because life happens. A kid gets the flu, you know, he rolls his ankle, but he's been doing all sorts of stuff before the year, before the season started, whether it was running on his own, lifting weights on his own, so he's physically ready to go. We're not gonna make him practice three more times just to be able to get on the wrestling mat or on, in the pool or something like that. So when does practice start? Like uh, per WIA rules or? Our, we, we haven't started yet because we've been plans, shut down. Right? We just got this one-on-one -on -one clarification. Okay. So we're looking to just start these up now. Okay. So we haven't, the start date's a little soft at this moment is what I would say. We were supposed to start a few weeks ago, Jack, yep. and that order came out, kind of shut everything down, and then public health clarified ways we could do it, and they're in the process of putting their safety plan in place for this one-on-one -on -one sign up. Once they have that, then they can begin. And correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but again, in terms of an incentive to do better, if I'm a player on whatever team, and I test positive, once we start team practices, potentially that could shut the whole team down for 10 days, couldn't it? No. Well, okay, so potentially. In, in, yeah, potentially, but in the current model that we're in, where it's one-on-one -on -one only, it, would, it could potentially shut Coach McKenzie or Coach Richter down if he was the one working with that player. But right now, the model that we're in, right. But no. if it goes to the expanded yep. team, that would be the reality. Yeah. Yeah, if we're back to group sizes of 10 and 15 like we were in the fall, then, yeah, potentially, depending on what group cohort they were in, it could, it could impact those other so kids. So there's really lots of incentive for the families to try to do as, yes. as, as, as protocol-wise as it can be. Yeah, if you have a student who turns positive and they're at a point where they're traveling to a game on the same bus together and basically do you probably are going to run into some close contact. Well, that's right. And I think you, these coaches, too, can tell you that based on and our, and our fall coaches that we had go, whether it was golf or cross country or tennis, our students' adherence, our f fidelity to the plan was, was just top notch. I mean, it, we, we had zero to no issues um, in terms of kids following the procedure that was laid out in front of them. We had good, we had good procedures laid out 
and the kids really did a good job of following those. Um, Brian, you had a question? Yeah, I actually got quite a few, but I hate to drag this out, but I can't, I can't, I would abstain if we had voted right now, because I don't have the answers I need. So, um, you know, the reason why we don't do, don't do checks with thermometers and stuff at the door, because we would have 1,300 kids to do. But I think our sports, especially our winter sports, you can take a temperature before getting on a bus or take a temperature before practice instead of just taking a, the word for it and doing a note. So I would like to see that incorporated um, instead of just writing a note and saying, here it is. If there's one person, seven people, 10 people in a gym, that's easy to just zap them for 10 seconds and get a temperature. Um, it says each athlete and coach will be processed and have their temperature taken daily before participation. Now, it doesn't say spectators. Yeah, it says athletes must present a signed daily check form, including the temperature of a parent's signature to participate that day of practice and competition. Okay. So that's what I'm saying. If they turn in a piece of paper like we do for a board meeting, they can practice. But if you can zap 10 guys in the head with a thermometer, that's better than taking somebody's word for it. That could have been filled out at 8 a.m. that morning. But doesn't the sentence right before that say that you will be doing temperature checks right so before temperature, they participate? Temperatures will be taken. Right. Like, if you read the sentence right before that. <laughs> okay. I know that's what I'm saying. This document needs some work because it's... Okay, so in terms of um, not playing travel ball or not playing an outside, so we're eliminating the two days of competition with outside team with that, yeah. that we currently allow. That's allowed by the WIA. But you're, I know. We'd be blocking them. We'd have a we, Yeah, they'd be moving back to our teams. Yep. They'd be what? They, they're, they're moving back to our teams. They'd be playing yeah. Ross. You, what, what? what I'm saying is they can't play those two other games that would outside of high school competition during the season that we would normally have allowed it, by you saying that we're only participating in the winter sports season, the school, not. So that means you're eliminating those two other play dates to travel with another team. You're getting rid of the two, the two games that you can play with the club team, for example. You can't even practice with the club team. All right. Okay. So, and then on the a test of the health of uh, opposing schools, if you had an athlete that had a mother or father or somebody in the house that had COVID, technically they would be out of school for because of close contact. Same thing would apply here, right? That they would be, so when you say included, must include no positive cases and all athletes are asymptomatic, it should say include all or no positive cases or close contact. Um, positives in a household and stuff. So what, what I'm trying to get to, we seem like we're making different rules for the athletes, where we're also having a report to the coach, where we're not having our students report to teachers about their current situation. They need to contact her easily or somebody in contact tracing and not tell the coach, let the coach find out through contact tracing that there's an issue. What I don't want is our coaches acting like they're making decisions for the contact tracers and Kerr Ely, where our teachers aren't doing that. So why would we allow our athletes to do that? Um, a, a point of clarification, Brian. Um, any of those documents as far as the protocols, the safety protocols, contact tracing, et cetera, would all come back through us. We haven't taken this document and vetted it all the way through administratively to put that piece in place. But absolutely, we're not going to have anybody else doing the contact tracing other than the folks that we have in line to do so. And but what I'm saying is it looks like their first call would be their coach instead of our contact tracing. And that's where I don't want to put our coaches in that situation where next, you know, next thing they know, they'll go play a game out of county. The next, then they find out one of their players was positive, but they actually knew before. And I don't want our coaches being pointed at saying, well, that's Wanakee. We'll let them play to get a win. 
you know, and so I don't want us to make an exception for our athletes that we wouldn't do for our students in terms of reporting cases. So that's, I see that throughout this document. And, um, and then also under transportation, you have no ride sharing unless it's members of the same household. Four or five down, it says, if carpooling is necessary. So you're already saying that you could carpool but above you say no carpooling with anybody except for your own family. So there's a couple things like that, including locker room use. No, no use of locker rooms. Next one down, locker room usage will be very limited. So this document needs some work. And, you know, I don't want to leave loopholes open because I don't want our coaches put in those situations where they are the ones making decisions and, and being reported to. I know they'll find out. I know the student athletes will go to their coach, but we really need them to go through somebody else, just like a normal student would. So, and, and I can send some of these notes to, to you guys afterwards. It keeps going on and on. <laughs> but really, um, I just want to be consistent with how we treat cases in our district. So. I'm going to say, I want to vote yes for this because I think having a, a policy and procedure like this is a good idea and I, I want them to be in sports. I think that's important. But I'm not going to go against the medical advice. And the medical advice right now, they shifted. They shifted from saying, don't do it at all, which is what they said a month ago, to now the biggest problem has to do with the spectators and the people around the event, not the event. If would, would it be possible to put in that I don't care what the local rules are for spectators, we're not bringing spectators? And I know that's a tough thing to think about, but that's the one medical reason they were against it today. I, I don't know that I have any way to enforce that. I'm not going to be at the games necessarily, and I'm not going to have my coaches checking at the doors. I don't know how I would, I don't know what enforcement mechanism I'd have to be able to do that. I guess that's what I'm saying. I'm not going to be able to travel to all those games to do, to make sure that that rule is being followed necessarily. That's my, but that'd I be my it's issue. It's the same as telling the kids not to play on another team. We don't have a way to ch chase them all day either. I, I get that a lot of this is about the, the public and the parents and the students doing what is being required to do this as safely as possible and some people aren't going to and we, we you're right you can't enforce every single one of them but we should not create the rules of the system that makes it unsafe yeah mike i think my biggest thing that i'm so concerned about and this is the same thing it goes with the attendance policy and it goes with this is that i don't like us incentivizing dishonesty and my biggest concern is, I mean, I, I look back to when I was in high school playing basketball and I was important to my team and I would have doped myself up with anything to make sure that I could play. And if I found out that I was positive with the disease that was communicable and I was needed for my team, I wouldn't have told anybody because that's how important this is. And if we find out that someone was positive, why would they tell anybody if it means that it cancels the rest of the team season? I just don't know how we accommodate that, how we ensure that this isn't disincentivizing getting tested. Because if you've got a cold, why would you get tested? You find out you have coronavirus and then your whole team season is over? I, I don't know how we account for that. Mm -hmm. So, I, Jack, I, I love coming back to your point. I love it when I can agree with you 100%. I don't know how we can do this when we can't have kids in school. That's just my whole thing. Um, I, I wish we could do it in a way that made sense. I just, I'm not hearing it. And Brian's things that he's bringing up too. I mean, it's just, we're not there yet in terms of what the rules are. So I do, I, I'm like Dave, I want to vote for it, but I, I, I want it cleaned up first. You know, I, I really do. I just, there's too many things that are like, if we kept it this way or if we voted on and we didn't change it, that there's, it's opening doors. And again, it's, our coaches shouldn't be in that position. Questions for clarity. Can I? Mark, the motion on the floor isn't about the protocols, it's about moving the date. Mm -hmm. The yeah. protocols is a work in process. 
that, yeah. isn't, that Aaron's admitted is not cleaned up yet. That would be the regulation piece. Uh -oh. But if we're going to wait until the board meeting in January to do this, the train's out of the station. You're right. The motion is about the date. I would vote no if there's no protocols on moving the date. But that's me. That's not saying everybody's going to vote that way. Could we but call the question? I want to be it. You can, you can always make a motion to call the question. Is there a second to call the question? Second. So all we're voting on now is just ending any further discussion and we're going to vote yes or no to moving the date. Uh, although the, the motion you did say, I believe, was the date with these protocols. If no, I recall. No, I said the, move the date. No. Rebecca, do you have what the motion I, I, I was going to ask you to repeat the motion, but what I have is the same motion that we had previously, only move it up one week earlier, um, and then I have dependent upon the public health order. Yeah. Okay. All right, so first we're calling the question now for those who want to end discussion. Those who want to end discussion say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. Okay, so there was one no, but do we have any discussion? We're now voting on the motion to move the date up one week depending on Dane County requirements. All those in, I think we better do this by a roll call. And mm -hmm. I think we were yep. doing that anyway because of I'm people give you a watching. So, Mark? Aye. Jack? No. Judy? Aye. Joan? Aye. Mike? No. Brian? No. And I'm no. Now, you could make another motion if someone wished to, or anything else on this issue. Can I just clarify where we're at then? Where, where were we at last where month? Where we at? Let me clarify where we were at last month. So at this point, if public health allows for practicing, or, or we're going to implement the practices on the one-on-one -on -one basis, we're moving forward with that. And then the earliest date that a, that a game could be scheduled is January 11th. Now, obviously, that document that Brian's been referencing that's got to get cleaned up, some of those are the safety protocols, which we need to sign off on administratively. It includes all the stuff you're talking about, Brian, with regards to contact tracing, etc. cetera. I mean, that, that will be consistent so that there's not any differentiation between sports and, and anybody else. Um, is that in line with what I'm understanding is where we're sitting? So that we can move ahead and Aaron can move ahead with scheduling things starting the 11th. We have those protocol pieces in place that, that meet our safety standards and practice can start in a line with public health guidelines that come out tomorrow. Is that accurate? That's what I understand, but you know, I'll just go on record saying I'm disappointed because that's what we would have had if we had voted yes for the fourth date. It's like the protocol isn't any different now for for the later date than it is for the earlier date. So it's going to get cleaned up. I trust our administrative team to do that. And yet now we're we play. But it is what it is. It's, so I'm just disappointed. That's all. But well, I think if it comes to the board, it's got to be clean. Why would we vote on something that's not clean? It wouldn't fly in any other profession. The protocols aren't going to be any cleaner. Protocol which makes me feel comfortable that they can actually get it done. So why would we? Why would we? Okay, not? Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, we're going to have direct discussions back and forth. Well, there's no motion on the floor right now. Um, if I can say one more thing, Dave. What, some of the pieces with the protocols we've treated administratively as the safety protocols. So things like you, you haven't seen any of the ones for weightlifting, cross country, volleyball. Those have all been pieces that we've dealt with. So that was how we kind of treated this piece. Um, I, I agree with you, Brian. It should have been cleaned up better than when we brought it forward. I put it in there just as a guideline so you kind of knew the gist of where we were. But I, I see that before we do anything, that has to be there. 
plus additional pieces like this, even breaking out the protocols for that practice we're talking about, have to have a written piece. So those are the aspects from, from, from my lens that we would be moving forward with. But I just need to see if we're on, does the board want to see that piece cleaned up and brought back? If so, I will, uh, we do have another meeting this week. I could bring it to for you to see. I can share it with the board. I can work with Brian as the chair of co-curriculars. Um, that's an option. Um, well, what about I, this as an option? In fact, I think I have to make a motion. I make a motion that we have a facilities committee next Tuesday and that we give the facilities committee the approval to vote this through if the protocols are cleaned up into the facilities committees. No, co-curricular committees, I'm sorry. The co-curricular committee and that they see the protocols are cleaned up appropriately that they can move it up to the fifth. So the subcommittee could move it to the fourth provided they approve the protocols. Yes. So what you would, is there a second to the motion? Second. The only reason I'm doing that is that the hangout for some of us seems to be the protocols. Two of three of those people are on the co-curricular committee, I think. And that that would still give plenty of time, some time for them to plan and set up. If we wait until the next board meeting, it's too late. And I think trying to get them to rush it by Thursday is pretty rough too. I know it's not the ideal answer, but it's a way to possibly get there. Did you hear my second? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm being heard or not, so. <laughs> Seeing no further discussion. I guess oh. I would want to make an amendment to that, that if upon failure to receive approval, it would be brought back to the board meeting in January. It wouldn't matter then. They already have the 11th. By the next board meeting, it's on the 11th. Mm -hmm. You already passed the 5th. You, you couldn't get the extra week anyway. Got it. Yep. That's why I'm trying to push okay. for it. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll skip. After your motion gets acted on, if it passes, we'll hold a co-curricular committee before break to address it. Okay. Uh, um, we have to, we need to do it by voice because of what we've been doing on Zoom. Mark? Aye. Jack? No. Judy? Aye. John? Aye. Mike? Uh, can you reset the motion? I'm sorry. The motion is to basically give the co-curricular committee the authority to approve the change in date and have a special meet, have a co-curricular meeting to approve that date and the protocols. Approve the protocols, if they approve so, the protocols, then the date will be So to be delegating responsibility for the vote that just was voted down to the co-curricular committee to deal with it later? Yes. No. Brian. Aye. And I'll say aye. So, four, two, five, five. Two. So we will bring, we'll schedule a co-curricular committee. Aaron will bring the protocols piece. If that's amenable with the co-curricular committee, then the date would move to the fourth. Correct. Okay. Okay. Anything more on this issue? Yeah, why don't we just move it up to uh, December 22nd or something. You can make a motion. Uh, it, it, just, it, it just bothers me that uh, it's okay to expose our coaches, but we can't get kids back in school. So the next agenda item is, oh, employment weather snow days. Yeah. This is kind of an interesting one given the times that we're in. And what I put in your packet is a, I was looking just for the board's feedback this evening. Obviously um, snow days are something that is delegated to me as far as something to uh, make a decision on whenever we have um, unsafe travel days. Given where we are sitting right now with um, K-4 um, in a hybrid and our other students in a virtual environment, it's 
just seems awkward with where we are with regards to inclement weather and snow days. So what I have proposed, and this is just a, a, a maybe something we revisit or we maintain even after we are back in person for second semester, but uh, making a shift that uh, during the current times that we're in, if we had, for example, a large snow event coming up towards the end of this week, then I would be uh, making a decision to really move us virtual as opposed to having just a traditional snow day. And the way I would do that, I don't want to make that decision at 5.30 in the morning. I would do it the day prior at a point in time where we would at least be able to alert families earlier and give our staff an opportunity to um, either have, make sure their materials are sent home, um, et cetera, and preparation. So I just wanted the uh, feedback from uh, the board as far as that approach um, before I sent something like that out to parents. I wanted to give you a heads up, that's where my thought process was. Um, how it will work and all the logistics of it, um, we'll, we'll work through, but it, it's, it may end up being some asynchronous, some synchronous, depending on teacher program, et cetera, but I think it makes sense to try to keep instructional pieces moving forward as we're in the environment we're at. Mark? So, aside from totally unexpected events, right. uh, technically we shouldn't miss any school because of snow days because of the advanced preparation piece. That would be what I would, that under ideal circumstances, yes. And so it's possible we could have an anticipated storm, we do this, and it's a nice day, but we're still doing it. It's just the way it goes. It's so. just the way it goes. Yep. <laughs> so if by chance there's a blizzard warning and by the next morning it's cleared and there's an inch of snow, it's still a virtual day. So that will good. happen, if yep. it's, but it's also the flip side. There's nothing predicted and all of a sudden there's an ice storm that comes through. Then I just have to call it as a regular snow day. Right. But I thought this is a way to keep instruction moving and it allows us to be a little bit more flexible. Well, it gives, gives advanced to use motion for that. I'd like to ask one question. Yep. Um, so you call it at 3 o'clock, which is after all the kids are gone. Do they always take all of their devices with them? Are I believe so, yeah. They don't now, ever What I'm going to try to do them. is, in, in reality, I'm trying to get the 3 o'clock time for parents. If there's something, I, I'm watching weather days before it ever hits. If there's a potential that you could have an event coming up on Thursday, I'm going to let staff know ahead of time that there is to be sending things home with their kids in the event that this occurs. So I want to be as proactive as I can, but it's not going to be as accurate as when I do it at 5 in the morning. So there's going to the, there's the potential for weather error is there, yeah. but we'll just have to kind of roll with it. Okay. Right. I may be trolling for like seeing if this is Tim or Roberta still listening to this, but is this, is this kind of like the end of snow days? As we know uh, it. It, it could be. It could be. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's something we've got to review for the future, but. Um, Conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what you saw a couple of years ago when we had so many snow days that districts were moving virtual. Mm -hmm. You start to see how does, if everybody has a device and it's there's potential for ways to Presumably in the future, something that could come out of this pandemic weirdness is that snow days don't mean no school, it means you're going to school at home. It's potential, yeah. It's potential. So it means no more room over high school kids with the dog and sand sledding here. Any concerns from the board members on this? I don't know if I need a motion. I just wanted to give you a heads up and make sure that you're comfortable with it. Thank you. It's good. Yeah. Uh, okay, so that takes us to the committee reports. Uh, the Medical Advisory Committee we basically already had. Most of you were in attendance, so unless there's any questions or comments, we'll move on to the Budget Committee. Go ahead, Steve. Hi, Steve. Yep. You, you have yep. to unmute. Or somebody has to unmute him. He's muted. He's muted. You're muted, Steve. There you go. Um, can you hear me? No, no. 
Okay, somehow I lost control of the mute button. Um, oops, sorry, some Amber alerts going off on my phone. So there was one action item for tonight's agenda that was the budget committee reviewed the referendum results and talked about some of the financial strategies available for consideration. The one uh, action that the budget committee was forwarding tonight was to take the capital projects that were approved previously by the board under the concept of being paid for under our capital projects fund 41 and to pay for them out of the referendum proceeds out of the $2.1 million. Uh, this part of what we did describe to the public during the referendum process. So the committee is just recommending the formal action of paying for those costs out of the referendum funds instead of the district's capital projects fund 41, which will replenish the funds back into fund 41 for long-term maintenance projects. Are there any questions at all on that? That's correct, yep. Unanimously. Thank you, Steve. Was there anything else? That was it. The only, we did talk about several other financial strategies that the committee wants to hold off on. Examples of that are funding our post employment benefit trust fund this year and a few others that we had talked about at the meeting, but there was no uh, decision to bring it forward to the board at this time. Thank you very much. Um, so from the budget committee, we have the diversity, equity, inclusion committee meeting. Someone want to handle that? Sure. Um, the minutes that we'll see in the board book are spectacular and are probably the easiest way to kind of summarize that. Really what the the committee is looking at our two major things at this point, uh, the equity audit that we're using through NEA, I believe, which is at no cost to the district, um, and we're proceeding through doing partial bits of that in every meeting we're having going forward because it's going to take up a lot of time if we just did it all at once. Uh, secondly, we are discussing kind of how to start getting out into the open discrepancy describing and discussing things that have happened in the past as it relates to all the different things that are under the penumbra of the committee's overall work. And we're going to be talking about that in greater detail tomorrow, too. So that's where we're at. Um, any questions, though? All right, then. Um, next is the curriculum committee. And I see there's at least one motion we have to take out. Yeah. Uh, the item that you see in front of you tonight is uh, I, the, the board can either act on this or I believe it's actually articulated clearly within the policy and it's with regards to policy and high school graduation requirements and procedures. One of the pieces that we hold within there is that our uh, particularly our juniors and seniors maintain um, a full course load um, throughout their high school period. What Brian Borowski has asked for, and the policy actually provides him the ability to um, approve students having less than a normal load. He's looking at just for this year only and for high school seniors to be able to, um, through his power as principal, allow them to have less of a load if they so choose to and they go through a process for that consideration. It's already allowed by policy, but I think given that uh, the circumstances we're in with COVID and some of the hybrid pieces and maybe some choices that some students may be articulating as far as how they would organize their course loads, this is latitude. He just wanted to clarify so that um, it was clear to the board of how he would do that. Um, curriculum committee reviewed that and was supportive. Um, initially, we're looking at a special policy to address it, but I felt that 
since it already provides him that latitude per policy, it's more of an informational item. Jack? So how many, how many students do you perceive have uh, less than uh, required lower? You know, well, if you're providing you know, all these great things and, uh, and, and glorious education, why is it a challenge for these kids to uh, meet their requirements? And Brian, maybe you can speak specifically to that just with regards to kind of what you're seeing with some of our students and where this might apply and how you might apply it as principal. Since COVID's come along and it's had a, you know, negative impacts on families and kids. Many kids have went out and got jobs and changed their schedule. Some kids are uh, starting to plan for college and uh, trying to save some money for that. So it's, I mean, we've always had these situations where kids either uh, because of uh, their, their schedules at home, uh, taking care of younger siblings, other things going on. Uh, really what we're looking at is just providing the flexibility because I'm approving a lot of these right now. And I just, it, it is coming up more and more uh, with kids and families that they're having uh, unique situations where they want to fall below that six, those six classes. So um, why would they choose to do this? It could be any of a, a hundred or two hundred different reasons why they might want to. They're still meeting the graduation requirements yeah. credit-wise, et cetera. It's just number of classes that, that, that they would carry as part of their load. That is correct. We're not letting any kids fall below this that uh, would be at risk of graduating. So. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I don't think we need any action on it. If the board wants to, to put it forth in action, just so that, that that's there, that's fine. But it's already written in policy. Thanks, Brian. Motion that we approve that. Okay. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? None opposed. Aye. Aye. Thank aye. You. <laughs> it's always hard to hit that mute button, guys. Um, so that was the curriculum committee. Then human resources committee. I don't think there's anything there to act on. Um, if anyone had any questions about the meeting. Then administrative reports. The financial audit will have to approve. I so move. Second. Uh, you saw the R was in there, communication for setting it up. Are there uh, any questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Next is the agreement with some Prairie for the 50% educational interpreter, which has to do with a student who recently came to our district. That's yeah. coming. Yes. The what? We're not there yet. Okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> um, any questions on this? Uh, otherwise, we need a motion. So move. Second. I think Jack won that time. <laughs> you guys are really competing well. Um, so Mark and then Jack for the second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And that passes unanimously. And now approval of the 21-22 and 22-23 calendars. Yep, so the calendars go through a calendar committee, which is representative of staff, Joan, and administration. Um, Joan sits on that committee as well. Um, we have articulated the 21, 22, 22, 23 calendar. It's set up very similarly to how we've, um, so next year's is set up to be the start of a normal year. And we put all of our PD days back where they traditionally have been. Had some conversations about um, structuring of where different days fell, parent-teacher conferences, etc. I think there's some good conversation that came out and grew out of the committee's discussion. But the committee's recommending these two calendars um, and then we will um, post them up on our website website and pr promote them to parents once they are acted upon. Joan, I want to thank you for uh, representing us on the uh, calendar committee and I make the motion to approve the uh, calendar as presented. Thank you, Jack. I will second that. Um, I would like to add that it's a really great collaboration of all the entities when they meet for these calendars um, 
you know, Randy gives them a lot of flexibility. They looked at, especially the beginning of the year and where those staff development days go. And, you know, we have a track coach that says, you know, if you have it on that day, then we don't need, you know, subs. Yeah, I miss Borowski's talk, but he thought that that might be a better. It, it's just um, a good exchange of a lot of people at the table that know a lot of what happens in each of the buildings. So. It's a great collaboration. I want to thank Brandy always for being uh, flexible and giving them a lot of voice in it. So, thank you. I did second it. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion or questions? I have a question. Um, are, are, is these calendars following all the stuff we did in revising holiday policies and religious observances back in 2018. I'm sure you all remember that fun. Um, are we still following that policy when doing the calendars? Tell me honest, I didn't even know there was a calendar committee. Sure. Um, and I mean, it's it's been brought up to me repeatedly that we take certain days off with our religious holidays, yeah. and some people have some angst about that. I, I check, Good Friday keeps getting taken off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good Friday was a conversation that did come up. I think there's yeah. two pieces. But one of the things is, and we did look at like kind of what our surrounding areas districts are doing, which were congruent with like other districts are, are taking that day off. It's also written into all of our employee handbooks as a as a holiday as a paid holiday for all of our employees except for the teaching group. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the other reason I, I kept it there, Mike. And there's a we did have a conversation about it, that it was brought it up. It definitely but, did um, come up but. and, you know, there was a healthy conversation about it. Um, and in the end, um, the staff felt that it was, it was expected because of the paid holiday and the community. And you're right, Mike. It's, it has been brought up to me by groups. Um, and I personally think if we asked school to be in session that day, we would have as many concerns or more sure. than if we didn't. So it's, it's a tough call. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for giving staff paid holidays. That's, I, I guess I don't know what any staff any say no to a paid holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the only other concern I have is, I don't think we do this for any other religious groups either, and that's where the other people start calling yeah. into question why we're doing it for one and not others. Sure, that's all. Sure. But I appreciate you doing the work and having the discussion. It was. It was a good discussion. Any other comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All aye. those opposed? And that passes. Next, some announcements and correspondence. Did you oppose? That was your yeah. no. Oh, I'm sorry, Mike. It doesn't matter. It's uh, announcements and correspondence. Uh, I don't think I have anything this evening. Then the consent agenda, where we could vote it all through, or someone could make and ask to pull something out for separate consideration. Yes, Mark. I move we accept the um, consent agenda as a whole, but. If you could recognize our two scholarship contributors, I think that we should do that. There were two scholarship considerations. One was a donation for the Mary Ann Zoner Scholarship of $500 to the annual scholarship that was made this year. And the other one was the Yvonne Ziegler, oh gosh, I hope I pronounced that one right. Um, which was $150 for the, the annual scholarship in her name. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the entire consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? And next is board business. There is the convention and workshop. Um, please notify Rebecca by the end of today. If you want to attend the convention, and if there's any special pre-conference workshops or meals you wish to attend. 
So you still have a couple hours. Your time's almost up, though. It's Zoom. <laughs> um, we have on here to discuss continued live streaming of committee meetings. We we did not used to live stream our committee meetings. Due to the pandemic, we started doing that. Um, I have noticed though that during the live streaming, there aren't a lot of viewers of committee meetings. Um, so due to the staff requirements to be able to live stream and everything, I'd like the board to consider stopping live streaming committee meetings. Um, unless someone has a serious objection to it. You need a motion on that? Or I don't think so. I don't think we get a motion to do it. So Is there a cost that we can actually point to for it? Or is this someone we're hiring anyway that we're just making? Well, it's about forcing our staff to be in here longer yeah, hours. Right now, what we have, we're, we're pulling probably two to three of our IT staff to run the equipment when they could be doing IT stuff. And all of the committee work comes back to the board anyway. Yeah, so it really committees, well, other than what's going to happen on Tuesday. Um, but it does give people the ability to see something either after the fact, too, because these are recorded. Yes. And then someone can actually go back and watch it and see what was discussed, too. I got to admit, I did not go back and look at views later. But there, there just hasn't been, I mean, like, right now we have 60, 70 people watching this one. Right. On committee meetings, you rarely see one or two. Don't we often have committee meetings in here? So we could have a couple people. If, if people, if those one or two people want to see the community meeting, yeah. that's what I'm thinking is yeah. they could come and we will save our staff and allow them to be at their regular job instead of being here. Mm -hmm. So without seeing a serious objection. Then, then, yeah, so as long as we announce that they could be present, as long as we yeah. are able to socially distance the number of people present. That'll, all, that's, that'll be, yeah, yeah, the place and stuff is always published with the agenda. Yeah. Okay, legislative update, nothing really. Uh, oh, there. I don't know how many of you noticed that part of the Republican coronavirus plan they're talking about coming back is that every school district would be required to pay parent, parents who have their kids virtual. $371 um, each. Yes. Um, for $371 the, each. You would come out about $1.6 million for the district. Why? Because that they feel that we have denied them education. It would cost <laughs> Milwaukee over twenty-two million dollars to their school district. Twenty-six. Is this state? Is this state? This is, state? Really this is a state legislature. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so it's it's something to seriously consider if you want to contact your legislator to say you really don't like that idea. I mean, I don't know how we would that would make such a monster impact on our budget. And no. it's V12 blown up and they don't have the yeah. override. Yeah. Okay. One would hope. Uh, future agendas and meetings. Yep. Uh, we have a couple of them that we need to schedule. I'm going to first of all talk about human resources and facilities. Um, we'd like um, a meeting set for ideally for like next Monday. That would be because I think it's important that Steve is trying to attend that, that meeting, both of those. So would it be amenable or available for our facility committee and our HR committee to meet on Monday, the 21st? For me to do Monday, it's going to have to be later. Um, what would be later? Uh, something like 6.30 or later. Yep, if we did. HR, could we go during the day? Okay. Sure. Brian, can you go during the day? Well, take a call, yes, Dave, Dave, can you do, Dave, can you do the No, you, Steve, Brian. you can do no, during Brian the day. Too. Both of you. Both that Brian. Brian already has to work all day, but you, Brian. <laughs> uh, I am busy from 9.30 to 10.30. Oh, we can work around that. Yeah. All right. Brian, is that, is your Monday flexible? Yeah, I can, I can make uh, anything work on Monday. Yep. Works okay, Steve? Yeah. All right. Is there a time zone you prefer? 11. 11. 11 o'clock? 11 o'clock. Okay. And then facilities. 
Would you be able to meet at 6.30? Is that what you're saying? I was going to do 6.30, but I can't guarantee I'd Would facilities work at 6.30? Yeah, I do the 21st. Yep. Can you use those? Sure. Okay. What can religion will let you know? All right. So we have HR at 11, facilities at 6.30, and then we had talked about pulling together the co-curricular committee. Would that work on the 22nd? He's on co-curricular at all. Yeah, Brian, does the twenty-second work for you, Hafer? Twenty-second works for me. Uh, earlier, the better. What time would be ideal? Well, Dave, what time are you available? Am I the third one? Yeah. Oh, I was, okay. <laughs> um, I can be here at four. Four o'clock. That'll work. Perfect. Beautiful. Perfect. Did you need curriculum? Yes, we, needed, we were committed to doing a curriculum committee, but I would suggest that we actually wait another month to do it because the two items we were going to do were uh, going to be bringing in some teachers to talk about how instruction has shifted, and we were also going to give an update on our assessment results mm -hmm. such as they were compared to the past grades compared to the past. If we meet in mid-January, um, our teachers, intermediate, middle school, high school, will be in a big gearing up mode for the hybrid pivot. And I would just as soon not tap teacher leaders at that time for another task. We can if it's really important to the committee. Well, it's final exams, too. It's also final yeah. exams, but so the hybrid can, in particular is going to be beyond them. So I would suggest we do it in early February. So I don't mean we also get uh, first semester grades yeah. for yeah. the middle school. Then you should be able to schedule that. I mean, if you're talking mid-January. We'll, we'll schedule it next time. Schedule. I just wanted to kind of make sure we were all on the same page with yep. the timing. Right? Yeah, no, uh, and I just wanted to ask Tim, because I know you got an email about it, or at least I did, about people asking was there sort of things that we were looking at in terms of how many students are failing and whatnot. I know you know I'm referring to Tim with that. So is that's the kind of thing that we talked about at that meeting? Yes. Okay. Cool. Yes. I Thank mean, you. internally we're monitoring Fs in particular. Right. Uh, in, in schools where we give Fs. And we're looking at our assessment data. Now there's a big apples and oranges with assessment. But we'll start with the curriculum committee and then bring it in. But if people have questions, you know, they're welcome to reach out. I've been directing people to ask you because I don't know squat about that. So. Come out in some morning and have coffee, and I'll I'll show you all of our charts, Mike. We'll give you a donut up there. Yeah. 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 And just the last thing that tomorrow you will receive the agenda for the retreat. Dave um, put together the agenda items based on some feedback that he's received from some of you over time. So Rebecca and I will finalize that tomorrow, and it will be moved out to. So we're meeting at Heritage Craft. We're going to meet at Heritage Craft. Yeah, five o'clock. Sandy, can you check on the? Budget committee on the 4th of January, please. Oh, sure. Um, can the budget committee meet on January 4th? I'm good. Yeah. What time do you want it, Steve? It doesn't matter. 5.30. 5.30. Does that work for you guys? How about 5.25? Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> 530 is great. So, yep, Thursdays at 5 o'clock? What's that? This Thursday's at 5 p.m. is what I have for that. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You're saying 6. Yeah, I was, but I think it's, it's just an error. 5 p.m. Okay. And with that, it would be great to hear a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, stay with Brian on Zoom. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.